Let us pray. Now, O God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer, in whose name we pray, amen. It never ceases to amaze me how in just a few verses so much can be found These few verses in the Gospel according to St. Luke are packed with meaning and with challenge and with hope and with healing. And if we could distill this reading to just a phrase. I think it's simply this. I see you. I see you. This text is unique to Luke. It exists in none other of the Synoptic Gospels, nor John. Notice that in this reading, No one appeals to Jesus on her behalf. Neither does Jesus ask her, what do you want me to do for you? Which is found very often in other healing stories. No one interceded. Jesus saw a need. He saw the broken. And he healed her. He validated her. He called her a daughter of Abraham. And that's going to matter in just a few minutes. She was bent over, the scripture tells us, by an affliction. And if you've ever bent over or I have lived bent over. If you ever had back trouble, you know a little bit about that when the back flares. When that occurs, your field of vision goes from here to here. You can't look up and see the world. Everything you know is right there, right in front of you. She couldn't see the world as it was. She could only see the world as she was. And while we may assume her bent over condition was physical, make no mistake, there are far too many other ways we can be and are bent over. Feelings of unworthiness, of not being enough. Poverty bends people over. Lack of access to education and the opportunities it affords can bend people over. Being labeled in all of the ways that we label one another bends people over. What the story highlights and what our experience tells us is that in all of the ways we can be bent over, our field of vision is narrowed as well. It also tells us that if you're bent over with whatever it is that does it, I don't see you. And I don't have to. It's far easier to avoid the uncomfortable gaze of the hurting when they are bent over. 
What makes the Sarah McLaughlin pet com animal commercial so hard to watch? You see the suffering in the eyes of something wonderful that God has made. And for the 30 seconds it's on, we can bury ourselves in our devices to avoid looking. Hmm, our devices. You think our devices bend us over? Afflictions in the neck, fingers, repetitive motion strain, it's a thing. Ask any doctor. I go with some regularity to be massaged. I've had back issues for years. And any of the pain I feel as the massage therapist is working out the knots in my back, do not compare to the knots the massage therapist finds here in my forearms. And more than once I've been asked, are you on devices a lot? I guess it's obvious, isn't it? So if we can relate in some small measure to what it means to be bent over, into this comes Jesus. Without being asked, and he heals this afflicted woman and says in so many words, I see you. And when the synagogue leader barks with empty, pious platitudes, Jesus says in a different way, I see you too. See, Jesus' rebuttal to the leader of the synagogue was in keeping with the tradition. He talked about, don't you even untie your animal to take it to water on the Sabbath? It was considered an act of mercy. Acts of mercy were not considered work and were permissible on the Sabbath. So in many ways, this leader of the synagogue has placed the value of this bent over woman as beneath the value of his own beast of burden. She's being treated worse than any animal. I will say a word about the leader of the synagogue, a caveat. This is one of those texts where we're tempted to paint the whole with the actions of the one. It is the one synagogue leader who is indignant. He's indignant not because he's Jewish. He's indignant because he's the leader who has misconstrued what leadership is. He's been over not by the authority his office provides, but the love of power he's been given. It happens all the time, doesn't it, in every expression of life? Some who lead are bent over by love of power, and we see it in their leadership. Those who fall under the scope of such a leader function poorly because fear, as a motivator, may bring what seems to be compliance, but it's a false compliance. Those of us who are bent over by fear do the very same to those entrusted, entrusted them to lead. And there are others who lead who are themselves bent over by fear. The afflictions of trauma and depression left untreated can crush us. With it can come the uncertainty that we are irreparably broken. Trust me, I can speak on this. Addictions of all kinds bend us over. And if your thing, if your addiction isn't a substance and you look down upon those who are addicted to a substance while you continue your workaholism and all other behaviors, 
that you're using for the same reason a person takes a drink. Wake up. You're bent over. So what's the purpose of the Sabbath anyway? There's this exchange between the leader of the synagogue and Jesus about the interpretation of what's important, what's permissible on Sabbath. What is the purpose of Sabbath? That might be the first point of entry that will help us. The point of Sabbath, Sabbath keeping. One of the great commandments of the tradition You shall honor the Sabbath and keep it what? Holy. What does that even mean? As I read it, to keep Sabbath is to rest so that you have no distractions or any other obligations other than to praise God. And that's what happened here. What does this once bent over woman who now stands up straight at the touch of Jesus do? What's the first thing she does? She stands up straight and praises God. She kept the Sabbath holy better than anyone else in that story. Even the one who felt that he was being pious in his compliance to how he understood holy law. Piety, being pious. Piety as concept has a bad connotation and it's because Typically, the only way we know it is that when we see it lived out poorly. Matt Skinner, whose commentary I consulted this week on this text, talks about the injustices our own pieties do that we don't want to acknowledge. Piety is meant for one purpose. It's the loving duty of honoring and praising God in our innermost being made manifest in our outward witness. But piety does have a bad name and for good reason. When our piety is focused on how pious we are and not how good God is, when our piety is focused on how dutifully devoted we are to God, and not how loving we are to our neighbor, we have skewed what piety means. Piety's purpose runs afoul when we mix those things up. When piety, when our piety obscures our vision, and we can't see the child of God in front of us. We're no longer praising God. We're play acting. Which, by the way, is what the word hypocrite means. Jesus calls, in response, that leader a hypocrite. It's another word we use. Of all the ways you might think it might have definition, It means, literally, play acting. So when we can't see our sister and brother in front of us, and we're not willing to, we're not praising God anymore. We're play acting. We're hypocrites. The variable here is intent. Some of us, upon being confronted by Jesus, realize our lack of authenticity Jesus' challenge to us creates contrition in us. 
And Jesus heals us from this bent-over condition of play-acting, and we can stand up straight spiritually. And our view changes. And if we're not willing to see what Jesus is revealing to us, hypocrisy isn't our problem. Depraved indifference is. So, it's not about the Sabbath. It's a whole lot about power. It's a whole lot about leadership. And it's mostly about acts of mercy. Jesus sees her. He sees her bent over, and he touches her so she can raise up and she can see the world, and the world can now see her. And he sees the gracelessness of one entrusted with holy words on a day meant to praise God and to be graceful. The assurance this morning, friends, is that in whatever way you're bent over, Jesus, Jesus wants to raise us up, to stand up straight, and he sees us. The thing that we bend over that we most want to hide, he raises us up and he says, I see you. My love of you hadn't changed. What's our mantra around here? We're going to love you and ain't nothing you can do about it. What happens when that's really true? What happens when that moves from slogan to activation in our interactions with one another? What happens when you can find the way to stand up straight and love the one that you've had the hardest time loving and you can say, I see you and I know who you are and I love you for who you are. There's assurance to be found in the one who will not overlook us. The one who walks with us, who helps us stand up. The one who says, I see you. Stand up straight. Be who I made you to be. No longer bent over and burdened. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.